Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to Celebrating Act 2, where my partner John Coleman and I get to speak with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. Hi, John Mariani. Good morning. Good morning. John, it's great to see you again. You, uh, as, a, uh, as a publisher and writer of uh, food and travel, and the publisher of the virtual gourmet newsletter, I should say. Which anybody um, cover like on Mariani.com. Anybody get it free, please do. Hey, could you do that again? <laughs> and well worth it. Where, Go to would that be John Mariani dot com? Yes, that's I, the one. And your ten thousand closest friends free of charge. John, what I was gonna say is that you cover uh, the world of um, of restaurants as well as food. Yeah. And um, I noticed, for instance, that the, we, we've talked about this before, the trend for a celebrity chef to open up a chain of restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I, now I notice, I don't know if it's a trend or not, but I notice celebrity chef restaurants, I don't know if they're franchises or not, but they're in airports. They're mm -hmm. everywhere. They're just, I mean, you know, it's. I, I think I'm going to run into a Wolfgang Puck taco cart someday. You know, they're, they're so ubiquitous. So the question I have for you is, why? Why are these guys doing so many restaurants instead of, I don't know, one in every major city? Would, wouldn't that be enough? Ah, uh, filthy lucre. Move on. I was from, uh, first, in defense of... of Fine dining chefs you may or may not be subsidized by investors. I mean, you can't open a restaurant, a fine dining restaurant, without having investors. But they keep out of the kitchen, and you choose who your cooks are and your pastry chef and so forth. It's a very, very expensive proposition. And um, the old days, 20, 30, 40 years ago, if you were the chef, and especially if you were the chef owner of a restaurant, uh, whether it's in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, you were there every night. Or if you were the restaurateur, you were there every night, going to every table and so forth. And you were there six nights a week, generally speaking, and uh, had one day off in which you might have come in and fixed the plumbing or something. Well, that's where, the way it was. And it wasn't really all that much fun. Um, so you had to have a passion for it. And you could, if you got to the higher ranks, uh, you would be... Uh, not only well respected, but respected for staying in your kitchen and cooking. Because if I'm going to be spending these days three, four hundred dollars per person, and I go to uh, call Shea, Shea Coleman, I really would like Mr. Coleman to be there in one form or another. Not oh, Mr. Coleman is opening a restaurant in Pittsburgh this week. Oh, so who's cooking back there? Well, they always respond by like Paul Boku, the great, the late French chef. Uh, who got in on this franchising early, and they said, but Monsieur Bocuse, you are a master chef with three Michelin stars. Who's cooking when you're not there? And he says, the same people who cook while I am there. You know, it's a patently witty answer, but has now been used to defend chefs uh, like Alain Ducasse, like um, um, Jean-Georges Von Gericht, and like Wolfgang Puck who simply put their names on the door or the menus. Um, and the original impetus was, OK, I have this fine dining restaurant here in Paris or in New York, and I'm making decent money, but um, I'm going to open a bistro also around the corner, uptown, downtown. So they open a bistro, or if it was, let's say, a, a, an Italian fine dining restaurant, they'd open a trattoria. And that's manageable. Maybe they're during the uh, during lunch service, or they can easily check in uh, 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 after service uh, at night and see how's everything running. Because the bistro menu is going to be pretty much the same every single night. Um, so that's how it all began. And Paul Bocuse specifically started started to put his name on a lot of places and in airports, uh, on silverware, on cognac, on bus, uh, on dinnerware. Um, and it became something of a, a embarrassment. Uh, yet, if you went to his restaurant, which is uh, in uh, Lyon, it was, it's still a very good restaurant, I assume. I haven't been there in many, many years. And the flagships tend to be 
And if you can find any of these chefs, um, that's where they might well be. Jean-Georges Vongerich, for instance, he is the world's leader. Um, he has, uh, I think it's 47 or 53 restaurants with his name on it around the world, including in Jakarta, including two in in uh, Morocco. Um, so I think I think it's 46. Anyway, how many times could he visit any of those restaurants so much as to drop in for an evening to see if the consomme is still being competently made? So the argument is that, well, as a restaurant company, we have, and each restaurant that grows, we have more and more cooks whom we could just switch around from here to there. And I said, well, 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 you mean the guy who is now in his restaurant, which is a steakhouse in Las Vegas, is going to want to go live in Jakarta? You know? um, the guy who is in Jakarta is going to go want to move to Morocco? And who are the other people there? Because what generally happens is you get a management contract. I pay you for your name. You have to set it up. It'll look like, well, I'll, I'll give you specs of the dining room and so forth. And then I tell you, I want you to do a steakhouse, even though you're known for fine French cuisine. You're going to do Jean Georges or Coleman's Steakhouse, or I want you to do an Italian restaurant. And we're going to put your name on it. And uh, you come in for the first uh, a couple of weeks in, in advance to get the kitchen ship shape, maybe appoint a itinerant cook. We get to choose everybody else. And if it's a union place like Las Vegas or, or, or other places, we have to work with the unions. So of the 20, 30 people who might be in the kitchen and the 20, 30 people who might be on the floor and the staff, the celebrity chef doesn't choose them and nor does his restaurant group choose them. I mean, nobody has those kind of resources for starters. And who's overseeing all of this? So it's like buying a pair of you know, Ferragamo shoes. We know that Signore Ferragamo does not make every pair of shoes, and Giorgio Armani does not sew every lapel on his suits. <clears throat> but when you start, start to find they're not even being made in Italy, and they're being made in China, and the, 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 the T-shirts included and, and uh, everything, then you start to scratch your head like, uh, what am I paying for? You're paying for the name, you know? That's what you're paying for. Is it going to be awful? No. Some are very good. Some are not so good. Some are mediocre. But what they do is they generally have uh, uh, the menu at this new place will be my 10 top hits. The tuna tatar will always be there. The hamburger will always be on there. The steak frites with the french fries will always be there. That chocolate cake will always be on there. OK, um, easy to reproduce those those kinds of recipes because those, are, of course, the simplest recipes to do. But if you're going to these restaurants and expecting that at a, uh, a, a, a Spago pizzeria in the Denver airport is going to be anything like dining at Spago in Beverly Hills, um, you're going to be quite mistaken. And as I said, uh, you can have suits made on Savile Row in London or in many other places. And they're going to cost you a very pretty penny, but everything there is going to be stitched, hand cut, on in Savile Row. I mean, you can't say that of of, of the restaurants any anymore. Uh, you used to be, but now these guys are multi multi millionaires. Um, <clears throat> guy Fieri. I mean, what is Guy Fieri doing when he puts his puts his name on him? There's this guy Salt Bay or something. He wears a t-shirt, dark glasses, goes into the restaurant, and he sprinkles salt from this height onto his steaks and then off. Um, I was once at a restaurant where uh, um, a very famous chef back in the 1990s, uh, Jean-Louis Paladin, um, <clears throat> had uh, Raja Verger, the very famous French counterpart of his, come in for a week of Raja Verger's Cooks for You. Verger came in, put on his white, like that, so did uh, Jean-Louis, and uh, held a press conference, what they're going to be doing there. And um, then, so let's go cook, chef. Well, they went out for dinner someplace else. And Verger was gone the next day. I once interviewed, <coughs> excuse me, Gordon Ramsay, <coughs> who had just opened a restaurant in New York. And I said, well, you're going to, how are you going to split your time? He says, I'm putting my heart and soul into this. 
I do my television work. That, that That's just like being a whore and making money. But I'm going to be here in New York two weeks a month and two weeks in London. I stake my name on it. Uh, but uh, actually, this this week, tomorrow, I have to go back to London to do a, a, a celebrity society wedding. I said, wait a you're opening this place tomorrow night and you're not even going to be here? So can you blame me for feeling frustrated? <laughs> So, uh, given all these celebrity chefs, many of whom have TV uh, shows and or frequent appearances, uh, of all of of all of the big names that have now uh, put their plastered themselves in neon all over the world, uh, which ones do you still think may have the best quality uh, if you're going to go out and spend? For a price your meal at a place where the chef is probably not going to be is are there any of these named chefs that actually still uh, care about the uh, uh, the food that comes out and the quality of it? Oh uh, yes, well I think they all care, um, but they can't be there to make sure that their cares are taken care. Of. I would ask everybody, um, Alain Ducasse, who originated in Monaco, Monte Carlo. Um, and uh, at the, the big casino there, um, three-star Michelin restaurant, very influential chef, um, brought more Mediterranean flavors into the dining room, extremely, extremely expensive. Um, he opened, maybe 10 years later, his first and only restaurant in Paris. Well, he saw there's money to be made in more than one restaurant. So he now has uh, oh, dozens and dozens of uh, restaurants around the world. He has uh, uh, one in London, maybe two in London. Um, and uh, he really, uh, I'm not saying he's there all the time, but I think his group uh, has the ability to turn out uh, first-rate food or at least second-rate Ducasse food um, on a wide basis. Uh, Jean-Georges von Gerichten, uh, the Alsatian chef out of... New York, uh, as I said, um, I've had mediocre food in two or three of his restaurants, and some of them do close, you know. And oh, I tell you a story in Vegas uh, at his place there, which was called uh, Jean George Prime. He was hired by Steve Wynn back in 1999, 2000, when Wynn opened the uh, what was it, the Bellagio? Yeah, um, and he brought in all of these celebrity names, every one of which is gone. Every one of them is gone, except for this steakhouse, because in Las Vegas, you have to have at least nine steakhouses in any one casino. And Jean-Georges has carried the, the toughest price, and Jean-Georges is great Alsatian chef. What does, he, what does he know about American steakhouses? Didn't matter. And he turned out a good product. So years go by, and Steve Wynn runs into um, Jean-Georges. Wynn told me this himself. And I ran up to John George. I said, John George, I haven't seen you for like three years. And then he says, well, that was the last time I was here. Okay. <laughs> Make of that what you will, gentlemen. Good point. Good point. But mostly, let's face it, we don't, <clears throat> I, you know, we know that these guys have so many restaurants. They're world renowned. We really are, our expectation is that the food will be excellent. Mm. And that it will be this chef's touch, his his recipe. Right. And um, I think most of the time that's what you get. Although, let's face it, uh, a steakhouse is a steakhouse is a steakhouse. It's the quality of the meat. It's the cooking. It's there's there's no. I don't know of any celebrity chef that has a recipe for a great steak, uh, other than, forgive me, Ruth's Chris. Mm -hmm. um, well there are, there are, uh, I will, I will credit Wolfgang Puck when he opened Cut in Beverly Hills 20 years ago. Um, he was, he had not only really, really good beef, but every side dish was remarkably good. Um, and then he was adding things that you didn't find on any other steakhouse menu for those people who didn't want to just eat steak. So there, there are gradations within yeah. steak. Yeah. But you no, know, I ask you, I ask you two gentlemen of the world. If you were going to a concert at the Hollywood Bowl, I don't know who is the current conductor there, official conductor, what his name may be. 
Uh, do you know? Anyway, I don't know. Yeah. So, okay, Art Kirsch for the last 10 years has been the conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Mm. You get tickets for next Thursday and you show up. Oh, Hirsch is off. He's 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 uh, directly conducting uh, the Con Cleveland Orchestra for the next uh, ten days. Uh, so we got uh, John Coleman to conduct. But I came to this Art Kirsch guy. I said, "Yeah, well, he's not going to be here." You, know? um, you go to the theater. Barbara Streisand and Funny Girl. Barbara Streisand. Uh, she's out of town in uh, in uh, New Haven. Yeah. So, Wait a minute, I bought tickets for Barbara Streisand in Funny Girl, uh, not Lois Schwartz. Um, it's really no different, as far as I'm concerned. Baseball, you know, you need, if you look at any baseball game, the manager is there, correct me, every single night that the Yankees or the Dodgers are playing. He's there, hanging off this, chewing gum thing, get him off yeah. third. Um, if he's not, He's not. He's not. At a, he's not in a minor league game that night in Tallahassee. Yeah. Well, good point. Good point. But I will tell you though that uh, as magnificent as I am as a conductor, Coleman <laughs> is just a crowd pleaser. He really is. So that was that. That was not as good an example as you could have given because and his fine dining experience when he's done with the concert is Pink's hot dog stand. It's I just, was going to say, world, thanks. world famous. Can't go wrong. Thanks. Well, I think All right, that that's, note, that's taking us down. Yeah. And, and before we go down any further, uh, thank yeah. you again, John, for an amazing uh, uh, look at celebrity chefs and uh, I guess the big business of um, uh, fine dining. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.